All right, good morning. My name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the Department of Pediatrics, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Pediatric Grand Rounds this morning. Um, as always, I'll call your attention to the text code for the CME credit on the left side of the screen. It is unique each week, so make a note and we'll put it in the chat for your convenience. And then also want to make sure you, looking ahead, know what's up on the agenda. We have really two outstanding events coming up. We're very, very fortunate that Melissa and Christopher have joined us as part of our program in medical neglect and medical child abuse, and we're looking forward to their upcoming pediatric grand rounds. And then a uh, real favorite for everyone is the resident housewide debates that we instituted a year or two ago. And this one is obviously extremely timing, uh, timely um, regarding declining care to an unvaccinated child in the outpatient pediatrics uh, setting and, and the ethics around that. And so really pleased that our residents are gonna be uh, having that session. Next slide, please. And then we're also coming up on the Pediatrics Research Retreat. This is the 12th annual event. It has changed. It's different now in, the, in being virtual. And instead of it being a full day event, it's three half days. We're hoping that's going to really make it easier for people to find opportunities to attend. And you can see here the morning of the Monday, April 19th, the afternoon of Wednesday, April 21st, and then the morning of Thursday, April 22nd. And so please register. Next slide. And this just gives you a sense of really the extraordinary spectrum of uh, people who are going to be presenting. It's an opportunity for us to hear about the very latest advances. Uh, Michelle Manji Desaroth is going to be our keynote talking about some of her extraordinary work um, in brain tumor patients. And then as well, we have our new chiefs of oncology, neonatology, a number of our new junior faculty who are going to be presenting. Uh, next slide. Uh, and the program committee did a really beautiful job of making sure we have plenty of opportunities to highlight our learners as well. So th a special thanks to all of them. All right, with that, I'm going to uh, hand off to Neville. I was just saying to Neville and as we were coming together that he's on an extraordinary run. They've had some remarkable adolescent medicine speakers, and today is no exception. So Neville, thank you for your service on the Grand Rounds Committee and as our division chief and for um, welcoming our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. It's a real honor to welcome our guest speaker today, Jeff Hart Cooper. Jeff actually is a practicing pediatrician here in Menlo Park, but he's also an adjunct faculty member of both our division of adolescent medicine, but also the division of general pediatrics. And he serves as the medical director of the virtual prep program for adolescents and young adults here at Stanford. Um, Jeff graduated from Mount Sinai Medical School, and then he did his and residency in general pediatrics at UCSF. But from 2012 to 2013, he served as an applied epidemiology fellow at the CDC in the division of HIV and STI prevention. So he's really uniquely qualified to talk about his project, which is really innovative. The topic today is actually called Virtual Prep for Adolescents and Young Adults, Expanding Access to HIV Prevention. So Jeff, over to you. All right, thanks so much for the introduction, Neville. Um, it's so great to be here this morning and to kind of uh, be sharing a little bit more of our, our program with all of you. Um, before we get into you know, all of the epidemiology and the numbers and whatnot behind this, I always think that it's, it's helpful to kind of ground ourselves in that patient story. And so um, as we're kind of settling into our Friday mornings, I just wanted to give the opportunity for everybody to just take a moment and think of somebody that you know who is diagnosed with HIV. And so this can be potentially a patient, uh, this could be a friend or maybe a family member. Um, and really think, you know, if you did navigate that diagnosis with them, just going back and remembering kind of what this was like for them. And obviously um, this has really changed over time um, as we've kind of found more effective treatments, but it's really important to kind of go back and remember that, that personal story behind it. And so um, like some or like most of you, you know, I've had several people in my life who were diagnosed with HIV kind of at different stages, whether it was kind of before we had antiretrovirals versus afterwards. And thankfully, you know, these days HIV is a very treatable chronic condition. Um, but as some of you or most of you may know, this is a really life altering diagnosis, right? And so uh, I personally have seen plenty of friends go through really deep depression when it happened, really struggle with kind of personal and, and family issues and acceptance around it. And so you can imagine back in 2012, when I was at the CDC 
and we kind of heard of this magical pill come onto the market called pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, it was an absolute game changer, right? Just the idea that somebody could take this extremely safe, extremely effective medication on a daily basis and dramatically decrease the risk of acquiring HIV was an absolute game changer. Um, and despite it being such a safe and effective medicine, I still saw over and over again, patients and friends, and these are people who are very successful, very able to navigate the healthcare system, but they still couldn't find a provider to provide PrEP for them. Or they would bring it up and the provider you know, would have associated stigma or they just you know, wouldn't necessarily be informed around it. And so um, as I was reflecting on kind of the journey as I was making this presentation, I really, you know, it, it's humbling to see that this is 10 years later and we're still really working to get the word out there to teach providers about PrEP and to take this extremely safe medicine off of these pharmacy shelves and just get it to the patients that need it most. Um, so I'm really excited to share what we've done with our program. I'm really excited to share more about PrEP with all of you today um, and answer kind of any questions that kind of come up in the meantime. So before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that this has been a huge team effort over the last year, two years. Um, specifically, I wanted to acknowledge kind of our core virtual PrEP leadership team. So this is also Megan in Adolescent Medicine and then Carrie, who's actually in orthopedics. Um, and also Jen and Salon, who are just a wonderful group, part of our really core uh, virtual prep leadership team, uh, without which none of this would really be possible. So a huge shout out. It's just me talking today, but it's definitely the entire group. All right, so let's get started. So um, we're gonna start out by just, you know, building the background. So um, objectives, we're describing the epidemiology of HIV, going through and outlining um, how to provide prep to your patients. Then finally, understanding the, the special youth considerations for starting and then continuing PrEP. And then finally going into describing how our virtual PrEP program can address these common barriers. And then also how this model can really be adapted to other institutions as well as other clinical needs. So when we look at the distribution of HIV diagnoses, what we see is that you know about 20% of these are among adolescents and young adults. So these are patients aged 13 to 24. Um, but more than that, um, yes, as pediatricians, we have access to this population um, and we're really you know, working with this population on a daily basis, but it's really important to think of this group as also patients that are carrying this message forward throughout their lives, right? So when we look at the percentage of these kind of 30-ish year old patients that actually have a regular care provider, that number is as low as like 60%. It's actually been going down over time. Um, and so this just really highlights the crucial role that we have as pediatric providers to teach our patients about PrEP because this may be the last time that they're really getting this regular source of kind of sexual uh, health messaging. All right, so this slide um, is looking at the youth diagnoses by transmission group in the US in 2018. And what we see is that the vast majority of these infections are among young M uh, men who have sex with men, or what we'll call young MSM throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, about 10% are among women who acquire this through heterosexual transmission. And then a very small percentage of those infections are among um, patients who uh, inject drugs. One of the barriers, but certainly not the only barrier, is the fact that youth have really low HIV testing rates as well as HIV status awareness. And so um, about 10% of students have ever been tested for HIV. And I think that, you know, as general practitioners, um, a lot of us are not that surprised by this simply because, you know, we don't routinely get labs on patients. And so having them actually go to the lab to get tested um, is a pretty significant barrier. And then you add on to all of that, you know, the confidentiality concerns that we have. And then of those youth who are HIV positive, only about 60% are aware that they're HIV positive. And so these are again, contributors, but not the only reason. So um, to get started, I wanted to introduce you all to one of our PrEP patients. Uh, we're gonna call him Jay, and obviously we're using one of our stock photos, um, but he's an 18 year old young man uh, who's in his first relationship with a male partner. And so now we're gonna try to make this a little interactive. Um, I want everyone to just take a second and guess what Jay's lifetime risk is of acquiring HIV. And this will be anywhere from zero to 100%. So we'll give people a little bit of time to type that in the chat. And Neville's gonna be 
moderating and letting us know kind of what people are guessing. So we have 100, 50, 25, 15, 35, all percentages. All right, that's a pretty wide range. Um, thank you everyone for participating in our little brief chat. Um, so his overall HIV risk over his entire life is somewhere between 10 and 50%, right? So that's um, a fair amount higher than a lot of the guesses, but I still want us to just realize like how high this lifetime risk is for our patient J, right? And then the second piece I wanna highlight is that why do we have such a wide range? This is a, a graph looking at the lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis by transmission group. And this was published back in 2016, uh, 2016 out of the CDC. And what we see is that there's really significant racial and ethnic disparities in terms of HIV risk. So we see that among white MSM, that's as low as 10%, which is still is very, very high. And that's up to 50% in African-American MSM. When we compare this to um, heterosexual men and women, right, it's just a fraction of a percent. So this is again, highlighting the very high lifetime risk as well as the disparities that we have. And so not surprisingly, right, wouldn't it be magic if we had a pill to reduce Jay's HIV, HIV risk by more than 99%? And that's exactly what PrEP is. So I'll say it again, it's a greater than 99% reduction in the risk of sexually acquiring HIV when it's taken every day. And for that reason, it has a USPSTF grade A recommendation for HIV prevention. We have two different options for PrEP, TDF or Truvada, and then TAF or Descovy, right? These are two slightly different formulations. Um, TDF was first FDA approved in 2012. Uh, but it was used for HIV treatment long before then. And so it has a long track record of safety and efficacy. And then in 2018, it was FDA approved for patients who are younger than 18. Um, and there, there's also a generic that recently became available for TDF. For TAF, this was a medication that was FDA approved in 2019, coincidentally overlapping with um, kind of Truvada coming into the generic form. This is only studied in MSM in a small number of transgender women. Um, and we're not gonna go to a lot of the detail around kind of which formulation to choose, but I would say that uh, TDF or Truvada works for the vast majority of patients, unless you have a really significant renal or bone health concern. Um, and we're happy to kind of go through more of which agent to choose kind of through other provider education materials as well. Um, as general pediatricians, I want you to think about PrEP like you think about contraception, right? So contraception is a daily pill that you can take to prevent pregnancy. Yes, we have other formulations that are available, which are absolutely more effective, but just kind of for the sake of thinking about this, PrEP is a daily pill that prevents HIV, right? And we're continuing to talk about safer sex. We're continuing to encourage condom use to protect from everything else that's out there. Um, but really thinking about this like a daily pill that we can provide sexually active uh, patients in order to fully protect themselves in addition to all the other great messaging that you've already been doing. So when we think about who needs PrEP, I actually think it's helpful to start out by thinking like who probably doesn't need PrEP, right? So this is a patient who has a, a very low sexual risk. So this is somebody who's always using protection, maybe has a single uh, partner and they're in a mutually monogamous relationship and they're both tested and they're HIV negative. Um, and or somebody who has very low prevalence in their sexual network. So that goes back to really think about that lifetime risk that we were looking at for kind of heterosexual men, women and MSM. And we compare this here to who could need PrEP. So this is somebody who has a current or an anticipated risk of acquiring HIV. Um, and that can be not always using condoms, right? So even if they're using condoms 80% of the time, um, there still is that 20% chance. And I just wanna highlight that, you know, recent STIs are only part of the story. So you can have somebody who's not regularly using condoms and then never is diagnosed with an STI, right? Just because they haven't encountered it through their sexual activity. Um, the second piece is that they're not always confident that their partners are HIV negative. And this part, what I wanna highlight is that this is actually kind of tricky to tease out, right? Um, people may say as they're meeting other people like, oh gosh, you know, like I'm HIV negative or I'm HIV positive. 
Um, but there's a lot of nuance to this, right? So do they know when that partner that when their next partner um, was last tested? Almost definitely not, right? There's not usually that amount of disclosure that happens. Um, do they know the status of all their partners since the last HIV test? So let's say that you know Steve meets Johnny. Johnny was or, uh, so sorry was tested for HIV like four months ago, but has had you know maybe three partners since then. Um, that HIV test result needs to be taken in context with kind of what's happened after that as well. Another current or anticipated risk, again, although we don't see it as much in pediatrics, is certainly injecting drugs and sharing needles. Um, and then the second group I wanted to talk about is um, thinking about patients who have a high HIV prevalence in their sexual network. And so a good example of this is, you know, the, the 19 year old university student who says that he wears condoms all the time, but wants to have PrEP as that backup protection. Um, just like we would provide contraception to the young woman who's asking for this, we would do the same thing for PrEP, right? We want people to feel empowered, we want people to feel safe. And so providing PrEP is a great opportunity for that patient to feel even more protected. And then finally, the takeaway message here, I think is that if your patient is asking you about PrEP, they probably need it. Um, no matter how good of a sexual historian you are, you know, there's a lot that patients are not telling us. And so I would say that if they're volunteering interest in PrEP, um, really listen to that so that you can provide them with PrEP if they do need it. Um, for side effect monitoring, uh, again, PrEP is extremely safe. When patients first start PrEP, they may have a little bit of GI uh, discomfort, and that's usually some nausea and gas that resolves by about a month. Um, one in 200 adults will have renal side effects, but in otherwise healthy adolescents and young adults, this is extremely uncommon. I haven't personally seen it. Friends of mine who are providing PrEP to youth haven't really seen it. And so I think that this is um, something that we wanna continue to check a creatinine for, um, but it rarely comes up in young, otherwise healthy uh, patients. And I would also say that, you know, there are different formulations of PrEP with a little bit more of a favorable um, kind of renal side effect profile, if that is a concern that you have. Um, the second piece that I wanted to highlight here is that there is no increased fracture risk, but we do see a very transient 1% decrease in bone mineral density for certain formulations of PrEP. Um, I personally can't think of a situation in which it would be clinically uh, relevant in order to withhold PrEP from patients in this case, but it's absolutely something that you can talk to with patients about. And this is very similar to the conversations that you would have with a uh, depo. All right, so to go through the nitty gritty of PrEP clinical care, um, before you start PrEP, the main thing you wanna do is you wanna rule out post-exposure prophylaxis eligibility. And so as a reminder to everybody, um, if somebody had potentially encountered PrEP in the last 72 hours, you wanna provide them with three antiretrovirals instead of two. And there's additional monitoring that you would need for that. Um, you wouldn't wanna start somebody on PrEP the next day because it's an incomplete uh, potential treatment regimen for HIV. The other thing that you wanna rule out is obviously you wanna make sure that they're not HIV positive and specifically thinking about potentially acute HIV. So were, were they exposed in the last month or so? Um, you wanna develop an adherence plan with the patient. Uh, you wanna understand their confidentiality needs because this is really gonna determine how they're gonna pay for the medication. And then remind patients that they will get rectal protection for seven days and vaginal protection after 20 days. And this is just the site of potential exposure to HIV. Uh, you're gonna wanna do follow-up visits every one to three months, and that's gonna mainly include adherence monitoring and sexual health counseling. Uh, you'll wanna follow up more frequently if there are greater adherence concerns for that patient. Um, but these don't have to be long visits, right? These can be very brief, and with virtual visits, they're very easy to do, so that certainly shouldn't get in the way. Um, and then for your labs, every three months, you're just going to be confirming the patient is not HIV positive, um, checking renal function with a creatinine, and then just doing a, an STI screening panel, right? So doing an RPR screening for syphilis, and then looking at uh, three site STI screening. So that includes urethral, rectal, and then pharyngeal gonorrhea, chlamydia. Um, you're also going to be doing a hepatitis C 
C uh, lab yearly, and then you do want to rule out hepatitis B prior to starting, um, as it could potentially flare if patients are positive and they're coming on and off of PrEP. Again, all of these uh, are available on our website in terms of provider, provider resources, but just to give you um, kind of a broad overview. All right, so um, as we know with adolescents, it's all about confidentiality. And so the, the patient's confidentiality need is gonna really determine uh, how they're going to access PrEP. If the patient does not have any confidentiality concerns, it's really easy, right? This is covered by all insurance providers, including Medi-Cal. Um, and even if they are uninsured, there's really robust uh, patient support and assistance programs. Um, you would be surprised how often we see patients without many confidentiality concerns for PrEP. I've had families send their patients to me just to learn about PrEP once they learn that their patient or their, sorry, their children um, might be becoming sexually active. And so, you know, we do live in a bubble within the Bay Area, but I'd say locally, this happens more often than you would think. Um, and then if there are confidentiality concerns, so we have the family packed program, which guarantees access to, you know, sexual and reproductive health services. And family packs will cover the visit in most of the labs, but not all of the labs, unfortunately. And so what we have to do is enroll them in a PrEP assistance program, which is provided through the state. Um, you can do this as an individual provider. You can refer them to our program, um, but this will cover everything, including medication costs. Um, and then just a reminder, uh, if you do want to just block the information, you can do myhealthmyinfo.org, um, but that needs to be done beforehand. And then we always have Planned Parenthood as a backup backup option um, if we're not able to provide these things or it's, take, it's taking too long to enroll in the PrEP assistance program. So that's a brief overview for everybody. If you wanted to learn more about PrEP and prescribing PrEP, I just wanted to direct you to our website, specifically the four referring providers tab, um, and you're always welcome to, to email us if you have any other kind of specific questions. That way, we're always happy to help. Um, so the final piece that I wanted to highlight was really looking at the racial and ethnic disparities in PrEP use. Um, and I also wanted to highlight this because this is a framework with which we built our program in terms of addressing these three key areas here of PrEP awareness, discussing PrEP with a provider, and ultimately PrEP use. And these data are from the 2017 National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Survey that took place in 23 uh, US cities. And this sample uh, looked at MSM with a likely indication for PrEP in the last year. So that meant having a negative HIV test, having either condomless anal sex or bacterial STI in the last year, um, and then any male partner in the past year. So in the red, we look at what their results were for white MSM. And what we see was there was a high level of PrEP awareness, but a pretty significant drop off with discussing PrEP, uh, discussing with a provider and then ultimately PrEP use. We see that those lowers are consistently lower among Hispanic MSM, and then also consistently lower among black MSM. So um, not only do we see lower numbers overall, but we also see bigger drop offs at every point along the way. And so, for example, of all the MSM that were aware of PrEP, 61% of white MSM ended up discussing it with a provider versus about 50% of black MSM. And of MSM who discussed it with a provider, about 72% of white MSM ended up using PrEP versus about 60% of black MSM. And so when they looked at these and they look at their adjusted prevalence ratios, controlling for both health insurance as well as having a usual source of care, what they found was that white MSM who discussed PrEP with their healthcare provider were significantly more likely to use PrEP compared to black MSM. Um, and this just highlights how important it is that we are providing this in an equitable way and what an important focus this needs to be and something that our program is trying to work to, um, again, make a dent in. Now we're gonna transition to think uh, specifically about youth and kind of talking about youth considerations around PrEP. Um, so we're going to go back to our, our favorite patient here, Jay. As a reminder, he's an 18-year-old. Um, he identifies as gay, but he's not out to his family. He lives near Fresno, and he's going to start at UCSD in the fall. So we already have kind of a geographic barrier there. 
of kind of having a local provider, but then also somebody who can kind of see him as he bounces back and forth. Um, he's hesitant to disclose his sexual behavior to his family medicine doctor locally because that doctor knows the entire family. And then he doesn't want to use his parents' insurance to pay for PrEP. So we're going to walk through to better understand the barriers that he's facing at each one of these steps that we went through with that previous uh, slide. So from a, from a patient barrier to PrEP awareness, um, this is not a part of routine sex ed, right? And so it's not even guaranteed that he's going to learn about this in his regular sex ed curriculum. And then he may be the only young MSM or gay or bisexual young man in his friend group. And so he's really unlikely to have a network of friends who are already on PrEP. Um, and of all the kind of MSM patients that I've seen just clinically, even in the Bay Area where this is a pretty well-known thing, it's rare that I'll talk to like a 16 or 17 year old and they've actually heard about PrEP. It's always a new thing that's kind of a surprise to them. Um, Jay's next barrier is actually discussing this with a provider. And so like we talked about, you know, he's hesitant to disclose his sexual behavior. He has significant confidentiality concerns. And then um, he's aging out of his pediatrician's care. So, you know, he's the 18, is he really gonna go and talk to his pediatric provider or not? Um, and he, even if he does, does his provider even necessarily know about PrEP? And then finally, a barrier to actually using PrEP. We talked about the confidentiality again. Frequent follow-up can be challenging, especially if we require these in-person visits to check in. And then adherence, it's tough for all of our patients, no matter kind of what aspect of pediatric care that we're in. And it's certainly gonna to be tough for him. This is the first daily pill that he'll really be taking. From a provider perspective, so, um, you know, PrEP was recently FDA approved. So a lot of pediatric providers are just not aware of it, right? Um, and definitely weren't necessarily trained to provide PrEP in any kind of residency training program. Um, because providers are not seeing this as often, there's, it's just hard to get comfortable with providing it, especially remembering all the labs to order and the follow-up and whatnot. Um, and it can be challenging to navigate confidentiality if the provider's not as familiar with it. And then finally, from a PrEP use kind of provider barrier, you know, navigating the payment assistance programs can be challenging. And then we have limited tools to promote daily adherence and retention. So now I want to just focus on the youth need um, for PrEP specifically uh, within California. So what we see here is of all the PrEP users that we have, how old are they, right? And so we see about 10 to 15% of all the PrEP users are youth. But when we look at HIV diagnoses, like we did in the first slide, we see about 20% of the HIV diagnoses are among youth. And so this really suggests uh, a potential gap in terms of um, making sure that youth are a greater percentage of overall PrEP prescriptions. Uh, the second piece that we'll talk about, and this shouldn't be a you know, surprise for any of us, I think as pediatric and adolescent providers, is that youth absolutely benefit from adherence support. And so um, this was a trial in the Adolescent Trials Network, ATN 113, that looked at 15 to 17 year old MSM um, in six US cities. And it looked at their um, dried blood spot measured adherence levels for PrEP over this 48 week period. And there's a few things that I wanna highlight here. One is that the very first visit, so this is week four, you just got PrEP, you're excited about PrEP, life hasn't necessarily gotten in the way yet. Um, adherence was pretty low, around 50%, right? Then we see an additional drop off as they transition from monthly to every three month visits between week 12 and week 24. And so, you know, we think is more frequent follow up helpful in maintaining adherence, quite possibly. The second thing that I wanted to highlight with this is that um, in the orange bars, we see the percent of original cohort with samples that were collected. And we see that there was a drop off over time. And what I wanted to highlight with this is that patients may come on and off PrEP, right? So they may enter into like a monogamous relationship or they're not sexually active for a period of time. But, you know, our goal is not to make sure that every single patient that starts PrEP stays on it forever, but we want to support them when they do need it um, uh, on like a more intermittent basis as well. To drive this point home of really the fact that adherence is key, um, 
I wanted to look at three patients from ATN113 who ended up becoming HIV positive. So they zero converted. And so all those patients are on the bottom, right? Those three lovely colors down there. And what we see in the blue at the very top, that is the protective level of PrEP. And so what we saw with all these patients who became HIV positive is that they never had protective serum levels to begin with. So again, really communicating about adherence and troubleshooting this is really, really, really key. A really great study that was developed um, and like a, a tool to help promote adherence, this is the EPIC study. Um, and the tool that they tested and developed was PrepMate. This was actually done uh, by a few docs at the San Francisco Department of Public Health um, in partnership with the clinic in Chicago. Um, and what they developed was this text messaging and interactive online content that involved weekly check-in messages with patients. And then the staff would provide tailored follow-up. So again, emphasizing the importance of this human connection with patients and really just showing that they cared. And then they added a daily pill reminder at a customized time. Um, and this took place in April to May, like 2015 to 2016, um, had 120 participants that were young um, and racially and, ethnic, and ethnically diverse here. And what they saw was, I mean, first of all, our numbers are much better compared to ATN 113, right? Um, so they compared PrepMate with standard of care, and that standard of care was actually really robust. So it included a risk assessment, it included PrEP education, brief adherence and risk reduction counseling, they had pager access to reach a clinician whenever they wanted, they had phone reminders for clinic visits, and they saw a video with how PrEP works. And so, again, because of this more robust standard of care that they provided, I think that they saw greater adherence overall. But we also see that those participants that um, were a part of this, you know, RCT really demonstrated improved adherence throughout. And when you looked at overall levels of the percentage of patient visits with protective levels and compared them to the standard of care, we saw that PrepMate had 72% of those visits with protective levels versus 57. And so um, when they ended up kind of analyzing this, what they found was that the PrepMate arm had two times higher odds of protective levels compared to standard of care, and that PrepMate efficacy did not differ based on age, race, ethnicity, education, or insurance. So again, this is this glimmer of hope that maybe there are things that we can do and engage in ways that we can engage patients to help mitigate these adherence concerns. I wanted to briefly also touch on COVID-19 and how it's affected PrEP and youth access to PrEP. Um, what I'll say is that this was just a convenient sample of about 1,000 MSM. This was done at the beginning of the pandemic, and they compared their youth responses, so patients uh, 15 to 24 compared to patients 25 and older. And what they found was that there, were greater, um, there was a greater self-report of social isolation, of economic difficulty. Um, and this is really relevant because while we as providers now know that there are really robust ways of getting patients to access PrEP, even if they can't pay for that, Patients don't know that. So I, again, can't tell you how many times patients come into our first virtual prep visit and they're just shocked that this can be completely free for them, right? So this really does serve as a barrier to accessing healthcare. Um, and we're also seeing increased sexual risk. So um, younger patients were, uh, had an increased kind of likelihood of reporting use of dating and hookup apps, decreased access to condoms, increased use of recreational drugs and alcohol consumption, and then decrease access to STI testing and treatment. Um, this last study that I wanted to highlight to kind of touch on the, you know, how things have maybe changed during COVID-19. Um, this was a study of a Boston Community Health Center. Um, and this was done at the very beginning of the pandemic as well. Um, but what it found is that PrEP refill lapses. So again, patients not filling their PrEP even though they were on it before. Uh, were more associated with younger age groups, younger than 26, as well as you know, racial and ethnic minorities, and then also patients who are on public insurance. Again, highlighting that you know, the patients that need it the most are the most affected, um, and specifically youth being one of those groups. Um, so the last part that I'm gonna go through is just talk about our virtual prep program and how our virtual prep program can increase access to prep. So our first step with developing this program 
was really looking at our entire Stanford Children's Health Network and just saying, man, like we have a ton of pediatric providers, right? And inevitably there's gonna be some providers with a special interest in this area. So how do we leverage that local provider expertise and interest? Um, so we developed this prep provider pool that uh, merges availability with any PCHA provider, so Packard Children's Health Alliance, and that's our you know, community pediatricians group with the faculty practice. Um, and through that, we're able to maximize the number of available um, scheduling opportunities for patients. And so when a patient calls in, the scheduler will instantly see the entire um, prep pool and find that uh, soonest patient uh, appointment time. The other part that's really important here, I think from a provider perspective is that providers decide the scheduling parameters. So, you know, a teen clinic provider is very different from necessarily kind of like what I would want in my schedule and we're able to accommodate that. For our virtual prep patient experience, so patients either self-refer or their provider refers to us, then they're either scheduled um, kind of quickly and directly using ZocDoc, um, or uh, they call our scheduling line, then they'll have their visit with us, and then we'll send labs to their local labs, and then send prep to their local pharmacy, and then our prep navigators will check in with them. Uh, I wanted to take just a minute to highlight our incredible prep navigator team here. So huge shout out to our prep navigators. We have a group of five to six incredible medical and physician assistant students per year that are co-managing a panel with their prep provider and providing this adherence support. So back when we looked at that prep mate trial, these weekly check-ins, that's what our prep providers are doing is really providing this outreach and support for our patients and just showing that we care and we're trying to troubleshoot these issues before they, be, they, they become kind of non-adherence issues. They also are helping our patients navigate these assistance programs. And so what is this experience like for our PrEP navigators? It's a deep dive into patient care. So they're developing continuity with a youth panel, which is pretty unique. They're learning firsthand the challenges of insurance and adolescent confidentiality as well as being introduced to virtual patient communication, as well as virtual confidential patient communication, which I know as providers, we're continually learning like all the different changes in Epic and my chart and whatnot. Um, and they're also being exposed to LGBTQ health as a lot of our patients do identify as LGBTQ. Um, really focusing on developing their patient kind of communication skills. They can do visits with the prep provider at the same time. Uh, they also have a lot of fun responding to some of these unique patient questions uh, that they'll get, uh, which is always fun to hear. Um, and then they're also helping field some primary care physician questions that do come in as they're kind of co-managing this as well. Um, I now wanted to touch on one of our educational interventions, which was how do we train providers just in time? And the way that we approach this internally within Stanford was through a best practice advisory. And so um, I want to present this kind of ideal use case. And this is actually a patient that we saw. This is a 19 year old patient that had a rash on his palms and soles. Um, and he presented to his specialty provider and the very astute uh, specialty provider thought this was secondary syphilis and reflectively ordered an RPR as well as an HIV test. When that provider ordered the HIV test, they saw at the very bottom here, a little hard stop saying, would this patient benefit from PrEP, which is a safe daily pill to reduce HIV risk by about 99%. And within that, the provider can select yes, no, they're not sure, or this patient's already on PrEP. And so what we see here, this is um, a slide that was developed by Terry Chan, uh, who actually just presented this at, at SAM last week. Um, but what we see is that if the provider says yes or not sure, then the BPA launches and the provider is able to select either a PrEP education module, a PrEP order set, or a referral to a PrEP specialist here. And then obviously they can always cancel it, they can ignore it, all these other things that we do with PPAs, right? Um, so this is what it looked like when it fired. And the piece that I wanted to hi highlight here is the fact that um, we actually included a little nudge around post-exposure prophylaxis, knowing that um, we would want providers to know about post-exposure prophylaxis sooner because the sooner that you take it, the more protection it provides. 
And so we included that as well. Um, now we're gonna go through some of our other provider tools that they were able to access. So um, this is an example of our standardized order sets. And this is again, targeted towards the providers that maybe provide it less frequently, kind of reminding them all the things that need to be done. And this is also, you know, saves time, even if you're a provider that orders us all the time. Uh, it includes labs, the medication itself, um, note templates, billing codes, follow up and whatnot. And the note template is also a great tool. And so um, just again, knowing that if you're prescribing this less often, um, you might need some prompts just to remember all the questions to ask. Uh, this note, which anybody can access within Stanford goes through kind of the relevant sexual history, reminding uh, providers to touch base about adherence, reminding providers to screen for HIV and then potential post-exposure prophylaxis, it goes through a family pack eligibility checklist, uh, goes through the different options of paying for PrEP, and then finally labs, and then reminds them about patient counseling as well. This is our provider education link. So again, one of the options that providers could have accessed through the BPA. Um, I think about 80 of you access this, which is awesome. Um, and what this was, was uh, a message sent to your Epic in-basket. So not your inbox where it's just gonna kind of get lost, but it'll just show up in your in-basket and it'll just hang out there and you can access it whenever you want. So it doesn't have to be in the middle of a very busy clinic day. Um, it can be a week, two weeks later. And that's where the provider can access either a PDF of the presentation or potentially um, a recording of the presentation. And then our final digital health tool that we had was a virtual prep referral. And so again, we wanna make this as easy as possible um, for that provider who maybe you know, hasn't heard of prep and they just kind of type in the order, like what is prep, it'll pop up. For that provider that maybe doesn't have the expertise that they feel comfortable providing it. Um, and so we generated this referral and the additional pieces um, that we included here were just asking the provider to include a confidential email and a confidential phone number. Uh, to make sure that, you know, just in case the data in Epic is not, ac is not accurate, um, they would actually go and verify that before they place the referral. And so um, our 19 year old patient with the rash on palms and soles, I actually followed up with this provider later who would end up seeing the BPA and the provider had said that they'd never heard of PrEP but they were prompted to consider it through the best practice advisory. He started PrEP with us within a week. Um, we obviously had a you know, secondary syphilis treated as well. Um, and he hasn't had any missed appointments and he's still HIV negative. So a huge success story. Now we're gonna look at a few slides um, that again, that Carrie Chan put together and presented last week about um, our provider responses to the BPA prompt. And so um, the BPA would only fire if the provider indicated, yes, this patient was eligible or that they weren't sure. And what we saw was about two thirds of the time, the provider wasn't sure. And so this really highlighted this educational and knowledge gap that we were able to fill uh, through the BPA. This looked at the follow-up actions that were taken based on the BPA. And so what I wanted to highlight here is in kind of maroon there is that people took follow-up actions about half the time, which as far as BPAs go is really, really, really high they only ignored it about half the time. Um, and when we look at the providers who weren't sure here, they were accessing the prep education module and referring and the providers that said that the patient was eligible and they were really familiar, um, they were accessing the order set as well as the education module. And let's get that kind of in the interest of time. Um, I wanna go back to our potential PrEP patient barriers and I just wanna highlight the things that we're doing through virtual PrEP to help mitigate that. So from a patient awareness, what we've done with virtual PrEP is we've done targeted digital patient outreach. So this is grant funded kind of through a really generous grant through the UHA PCHA Research, uh, Research Learning Collaborative. Um, and this allowed us to kind of target patients outside of our immediate referral network through Stanford and really reach them throughout the state. For the discussing with a provider, what we're doing is we are bringing a trained adolescent PrEP provider to the patient anywhere within California, right? And so we're making that local expertise possible. Um, 
And we're also able to leverage the really amazing network that we have that's a combination of PCHA and, uh, and faculty to say, you know, as this program continues to grow and develop, and more providers are interested, we can easily add them to our prep provider pool to increase patient availability. Um, and because of that dynamic ability to do that, we will always have schedule availability within one week. And if we're falling behind, it's easy to recruit more providers to increase that availability that way. And then finally, from a prep use perspective, so our prep navigators are amazing. They are absolutely instrumental in terms of uh, adherence support and then helping with patient assistance programs. And then the last part I wanna highlight is just, it is so much easier to do these brief, frequent patient follow-ups. I've had patients follow up with me from the middle of a shift at a fast food restaurant, from the beach, from their car when their car broke down, right? But all these barriers that could get in the way from them coming back, we're able to reduce with virtual prep. And from a provider perspective, right, what are we doing to help close that gap? Um, we've done webinars. We talked about our best practice advisory. Um, we talked about our standardized order sets. We are also available for any personalized kind of questions that come up. And then we're now developing a CME around this to get the word out even more. Uh, for assisting providers with discussing this with patients, we have a website with provider resources. And we also offer this referral for providers that would, for, would prefer to just refer their patients. Um, and then finally, from a use perspective, um, we're able to leverage certain tools within Epic that help us to kind of track patients and remind providers as well. And so we're going to go back to our patient, Jay. Um, so he was able to start prep within a week as well. Um, as a part of our routine STI screening, he was, you know, diagnosed with an STI and successfully treated. Um, he has had two sexual partners since starting prep. So again, he was only with his first partner when we met him. Um, that has really developed more partners since then. So we're really glad that he was able to get on PrEP. Um, and another part is that now that, you know, he's using condoms most of the time, which was better than before. And this is a pretty significant improvement in terms of like our ability to impact his overall sexual health. And it comes from really building a relationship with him over time and him feeling comfortable asking us these kind of more personal questions. And because, you know, he's going to school in San Diego, he's able to, to see us from either place. And so now we're at a point in the development of our program, right, where um, we started out wanting to be a resource for Stanford providers and Stanford patients, but we're really expanding our scope to reach beyond Stanford and to be able to fill that need in a more, in more of a broad sense. Um, this is a, a map that just highlights the concentration of new HIV diagnoses in California in 2017 on the left. And what we see is kind of the darker the county, the more HIV diagnoses. And on the right, we see uh, our map of all of our virtual PrEP referrals. And so what is so cool about this is the fact that um, you can really see, first of all, how we're reaching patients throughout the state because of this digital patient outreach that we have, but also how these are concentrating in the areas that potentially have the greatest need. And then I just wanted to end with um, highlighting some of the, the press coverage that we've gotten through this program. And I think that, you know, virtual prep is such a wonderful example of the intersection of Stanford's commitment to health equity, to digital health innovation, um, and to patient care. And so um, this is just some of the press coverage that we've been able to get. Um, and I just think that there's so much potential for us to kind of take the amazing resources that we have and to leverage them to provide more access uh, to patients who do not have access within their immediate community. And so for our takeaway messages here, um, just a reminder that in California, youth account for about a fifth of new HIV diagnoses and have the lowest PrEP use compared to other age groups. Um, you now know how to screen for PrEP and provide PrEP, so congratulations. And if you wanna learn more, uh, we have more information on our website. Uh, to bring up the fact that provider training and referral programs really can help navigate around some of these PrEP barriers. And the three pieces that we really tried to drive home was the importance of our PrEP navigators, um, the idea of this just-in-time kind of more relevant provider education, and then finally just creating an easy way for providers to refer if they do want additional support. Um, and I just wanted to end with thinking about virtual PrEP as a model that can be adapted 
very easily to other institutions, whether it's within California or more broadly, and also other clinical needs, right? So um, this is just an example in a model that you may be able to adapt to your own practice or your own interests. And we're happy to kind of provide, you know, advice and kind of counsel as you, as you approach that. Um, and I just, our last slide is just a huge, huge, huge thank you. Um, I think that we've been so lucky to get so much support um, from Stanford. So specifically just calling out how appreciative we were to get this grant through the PCHA, UHA Research Learning Collaborative, um, you know, the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute, our phenomenal digital health team, Salon, Natalie, Aaron, um, the Division of Adolescent and Neville Support, as well as with General Pediatrics and Lees, um, PCHA, specifically Andy and Sylvia, and then our fantastic ID, or sorry, IT and past support from everything from building the, the platform to scheduling. Um, our field marketing team is like absolutely incredible. So Amy and Edgar, um, we could not have gotten the word out there without them. And um, we're just so grateful for their support um, as well as the San Francisco Department of Public Health. So. Uh, with that, we have a, a few extra minutes and I'm happy to take questions. Um, this is our contact information if, if we can be helpful. Thank you, Jeff. That, that was terrific. Talk about innovative ideas that have far reaching impact. Um, <clears throat> wonderful. So there are a couple of questions and we do have a couple of minutes. So the first question is what's the annual cost of PrEP? Great question, right? Um, so the brand name, so either Truvada or Descovy, is around $1,800 to $2,000 per month. Now with the generic formulation being available, uh, I just checked this last night and Walgreens was offering generic Truvada for about 500 bucks a month. Um, but this is all covered through these different uh, payment assistance programs. And so there's been a really robust public health emphasis and support around that. And so patients really can access this at little to no cost. Okay, great. He has another question. What's the pharmacological mechanism of action and excretion? Specifically, do renal side effects increase with the duration of use given that this is a lifelong medication? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that um, we can kind of talk online around the specific, um, you know, pharmacokinetics and whatnot, but I'll say that this is, you know, renally excreted and it does have the potential to concentrate in the renal tissues, but I just want to emphasize the fact that this is an extremely safe medicine. And to your point about like, if there is a lifelong impact, um, this has been used to treat HIV for years and years and years and years. So we have a long track record of safety. Um, and I also want to bring up that this can actually be used more intermittently, right? So somebody may use it for a few months and then they may move on to a monogamous relationship and stop using it. And so, um, it's going to really vary depending on each patient's specific needs. Another question. Is there a risk calculator based on the number of sexual partners, whether they heterosexual or men who have sex with men? Yeah, I think that this is, um, there are risk calculators. There's one on our website uh, that the CDC actually developed. But I think that what this comes down, so if you want to kind of have the exact numbers or an approximation, you can use that they're gonna be heavily um, swayed depending on what local prevalence is, right? So the, the question that I always try to think about is like, what is the chance that this patient's next sexual partner might be HIV positive, right? And that's a good framework for doing it. But I would say at the end of the day, if somebody wants that peace of mind of having this additional protection, and you feel like as a clinician, there is even the smallest possibility that they could acquire HIV, you should really be talking to your patients about this and then through joint decision-making, deciding whether this is something um, that that patient wants to take or not. And a follow-up from this, so another question, how does the youth infection rate here compare to other major states or other cities in the United States, such as New York City or Boston? Yeah, so um, we see a much greater burden of HIV infection in the Southeast compared to California. So I'd say that overall, our numbers are much lower compared to other areas. And so when we think of, you know, access, what's so great about this model is that this can easily be developed at other institutions as well and adapted. And so um, we would hope that especially areas with even greater need would be able to develop similar programs. Okay, great. One more. 
how do you manage accessibility, follow through and confidentiality in getting the lab work done? Um, yeah, it, it's hard. That's why we had to develop the program, right? Um, so, you know, that's why we have family packed as this payer for patients with confidentiality needs. And then our prep uh, navigators help them to be able to participate in these prep assistance programs. And so we are able to navigate that well. The other piece that I would say too, is that um, you would be surprised how often patients are okay with this being on their parents' insurance in some way. It's, I don't know, it, it's hard to say an exact number, but I'd say at least about 50% of the time. Um, and these are all challenges that while they're significant, they should not get in the way of a patient accessing PrEP. Okay, um, two more questions. Any risk of resistance with poor compliance? Um, so there's kind of two questions baked into that one, right? So like one is that even if you are 100% compliant, is there a chance of requiring or acquiring it as a resistant strain? It's extremely, extremely low, but there have been case studies. And so that's why when I talk to my patients, I say, this is not 100%. It's a greater than 99%, but this is not 100%. And that's why we want to talk about condoms. Um, the second question that was kind of baked into that was if somebody is taking this in a kind of sub-therapeutic way. So let's say they're taking it three times a week instead of the recommended, you know, four to seven. Um, can they be kind of partially treating HIV? And the answer is in that case, yes, you could potentially develop resistance that way. And that's why understanding adherence and promoting adherence is key. Because at the end of the day, in that second case, that, sh that should not get in the way of that patient accessing PrEP, right? They have a behavior that's putting them at risk for PrEP and PrEP is their best, or, or risk for HIV and PrEP is their best chance of protecting themselves from getting HIV. It's not that being on PrEP causes them to behave in a way that they would get HIV otherwise. Okay, last question. Anything like this for getting more providers to offer plan B to patients? Can you say that again? Sorry, you broke up in the beginning. Any, any other program like this to offer plan B? You know, um, yeah, it's a great question. And that's something that um, we've been thinking about a lot as well. I'm not aware of any similar program, but I think that, again, thinking of this as a model, you could easily adapt this to kind of other clinical needs. And I think that, you know, offering plan B through that same framework of, you know, um, post-exposure prophylaxis and PrEP is kind of thinking of, you know, plan B and then um, contraception to prevent pregnancy as well. Okay, terrific. I think the discussion was amazing. There are lots more questions as well. <laughs> we were able to deal with not all of them, but most of them. So once again, thank you, Jeff, for a wonderful presentation and a great discussion. Yeah, and Thanks again, everyone. that's our email. If you have any questions, feel free to follow up. Thanks for having me. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.